Boy, look at all this mess on the on the bench. A uh, couple of subjects. I'm gonna make this one kind of short, but uh, let me get the axe stuff out of the way for now. Been kind of busy, and I'm gonna go up and run my big old holes for me. And uh, it's hot, so I'm gonna have to worry about things like hydration. Stuff like that. But, uh, one of the questions that actually got asked today, you know, a guy came down and said, hey, I know I got the cover off and I think I tripped the chain brake and I couldn't get it back on. So I figure we'll start the, the day with just a real fast reminder on how to deal with that. So here's a 562 cover from a saw that I got to work on, which is another story. And sometimes what will happen is the person will trip the chain brake like this. And now the band is contracted because it's supposed to be squeezing that clutch, right? Now you, won't, you can't get the cover on. Well, to undo the brake is real easy. That's it. Basically take a pair of pliers, there's a little bump right there, and you can just get behind that bump with a pair of pliers like this and squeeze. And then the chain brake is reset and it'll go on the side of the saw. So there's a tip. Might be obvious to some, but for others it's not. And this fellow came down and I did that for him. And in return, we had conversation. And I learned something. I've been doing these chicken chick to chicken soups axes now for a while. And he took a look at that and he goes, Well, that handle is probably not the best, but it'll work. I'm like, Really? Okay, what am I looking at? And he proceeded, and Pete, you know who you are, he proceeded to give me a lesson on baseball bats and how that translates into axe handles and the message that he gave me is when you're choosing your axe handles get this off of here when you're choosing your axe handles the way the grain is actually matters i guess intrinsically i had a, an idea but i never really put a lot of thought into it this is a husqvarna branded axe handle and this is for my mall because I had messed it up a couple years back and I kept telling myself I'm going to put a new handle on it. And fortunately for me, when I was down at Bob's, I picked this one up. And uh, it's a hickory handle. And the thing that's noticeable is, you see how these are right here? Those, those sections like this, like this. Well, that gives you an indication of where the grain is. Right? It's that long one right there. If you were to look at the end of this handle, you'll see the grain going like this. See it? That's not perfect, but it's good. Perfect would be if it was absolutely in line with the shock force it's going to get when it hits. It's kind of like this. It's kind of like the concept of having uh, two by fours and laminate like this, where they're stronger because of the, of the distance from edge to edge versus like this, where they're not quite as strong, they're a little more flexible, more likely to delaminate if they're glued together. So having the grain cross this way, you have those slabs that are in line with uh, being able to support the shock load that happens when you hit, you know, your piece of wood real hard. And you can see these slabs right here, that's what these are. The grain is, is you know, maybe 10 degrees off linear but that's actually a decent handle because of the way the grain is does that make any sense you see how the grain is up here well here's one that's not good and i've used this now for quite some time if you notice you see those old sections right there the slabs are in fact the grain is this way instead of having the grain like this like the husqvarna handle is there in fact this way 
So now all the laminations are right here. Right across here, you can see the grain right here. Instead of having these slabs show up right here, instead of having slabs like that, you're looking at the grain. See it right here? 90 degrees out of phase from where it should be, which means the likelihood of this handle splitting is a lot higher than this handle, where the laminates are in line with the forces that it has to deal with. So, next time I go looking for an axe handle, when I break this one, because I eventually will, I'm going to be paying a whole lot of attention to where the grain is. I bought this one here because it looked cool. I like the color, without any regard to the grain. Well, a couple years later, it's still doing. I bought this axe handle up north, and again, you can see where the grain is. And that's not conducive to strength. You see where the grain is right here? Where they're directly 90 degrees to the force it's going to receive. If you look at the end, eh, you know, it's kind of like this. It's not terrible, but still this is a subpar handle because of where the grain is as compared to that Husqvarna branded handle. But that doesn't matter. What I'm going to use this for is a wedge driver. And if it breaks, I'll just peel it out and put another handle in with new knowledge. I may start looking for handles when I go to hardware stores to try to find them with the proper grain. So I got this axe head at a flea market deal over at Bockville, New York. And uh, every time I go there, I try to find axe heads for $10, $15. And I have no idea what the brand is. It's not a famous brand, which is why you can get them for $10, $15 and not $20, $30, sometimes $50. But what I found over time is I like the profile where they take out a little material right here and right here they kind of leave it in the middle and plus it's not too awful square up there up there by the the cutting edge I like that profile this axe here works beautifully in my wood and so I found another one a little bit lighter where again it has a little more material right here but it's dished out right here and dished out right here so I bought it ten dollars We'll clean it up and I'm not using this to split I'm going to use this for a wedge driver so I'll grind that back but I was in the middle of just putting that axe head on this handle when when Pete informed me that the handle is probably not the best because of the orientation of the grain <laughs> but uh, man it's hot out so I guess the other thing I learned from one of the other channels, I believe it was either Buck and Billy Ray or one of those guys, is I used to cut this flush. And actually, again, this has lasted for a couple of years. I had cut that flush because it kind of is what I was used to seeing from store-bought axes. But I'm going to leave, based on what I've learned this last couple of years, I'm going to cut that and leave a little bit up there. So it kind of like mushrooms a little bit. And uh, trying to take this boy's axe handle and turn it into a wedge driver because this is the wedge driver I had built out of junk parts. Works beautifully. I really need to put a knob on here. So I might take a piece of wood and try to make it form, fit here, glue it on, pin it, or maybe just get some hockey stick tape like I did when I played ice hockey and just wrap the end of that handle to have something where it doesn't slide out of my hands. And then in the quest of having a better wedge driver I came up with this concept right here. Just using a boy's axe handle on a three pound head and hopefully it'll work. This works beautifully and you can wail on on the wedges with this sucker here and it's just not too long so it's not hard for me to carry around. A full-sized axe it's a little hard for me to, to carry it around, which is why I'm going for the shorter ones. So anyway, that's just sort of incidental stuff. What I wanted to talk about today really has nothing to do with axes and chain brakes or any of that stuff. I got this 562 in. And the complaint is it won't start. And sure enough, I could not get it to start. Well... What happens on these 562s and all the 5 Series is 
every time something goes wrong with a saw, it's got to be because it's an autotune, right? And Bob has told me for a long time that, you know, a chainsaw is a chainsaw, whether it has autotune or a carburetor or whatever it has, fuel injection is still a chainsaw, a two-stroke is a two-stroke. And my experience over the last 10, 15 years has pretty much supported that. So this is a later model one. And the reason why I know it's a later model one, it's got the T27 steel copy fasteners, right? And it has a cut cover. I think this is like a 2016, maybe 17, uh, generation 562. I'll look at the tag at some point. And it died. And this saw belongs to a logger. And I would be willing to say, without plugging it into common service tool, because the point of this video is simply to repair it without using common service tool, like most 562s would require. Um, but this is a saw that has a lot of time on it. You know, this is a production saw in a logger's operation, and I had done this uh, filter, I don't know, probably when they first came out, 2020, that couple years back, I think it was. And, uh, and the saw just ran and ran and ran, came back last week, and it won't start. And uh, so I started looking around for obvious clues. And if you know my channel, I don't know if I ever go through the diagnostics. I always do. But the first thing I always do is I go pull the spark plug and check for compression. I just want to know if the top end is worth anything. You know, assuming it won't start. If it, won't, if it starts, I'll fire it up first and listen for things. But when it won't start, pretty much the first thing I go to is, is, is a compression, spark, and then looking for some fuel supply issue, like a, like a uh, collapsed fuel line or a hole in the fuel line. Those are the top three things, anyway, that happens. So, as I normally do, I pull the cover and I pull the spark plug, and this is what came out. See anything wrong with that? That ain't good. Not only that, it was in finger tight. So, a combination of the electrode being gone and the plug being literally finger tight, it had no compression and virtually no spark. It was probably arcing across <laughs> the remnants. And uh, put a spark plug in there and it ran. But now it makes a clatter. So now I have a problem in, in the sense that it makes a lot of, of piston slap and a lot of top end type noises. So, seeing as it ingested that little electrode, that's rare. I don't see that often. I mean, that's a brand name plug. Seeing as it's ingested that uh, electrode, God only knows what I'm going to find when we pull it apart. But let's see if it'll fire so you can hear the racket. I don't know if it has much gas in it. But I did put a spark plug in there, and the threads were solid enough that I could crush the gasket. So that's good news, I guess. So here's the question. I could bring it right back to the guy and say, hey, I got it running. Or <laughs> do I pull it apart and oh man, that's, a, that's the decision. I think what I'm going to do is call him and have him decide should I pull it apart and see whether or not the piston's damaged. That's, that's a lot of piston slap. You know, it runs, runs good. Now, I would pull the solder if it was my saw. And the reason I would go about pulling the solder on that is because if you actually do let the top end frag on you and come apart, now you almost have to do the bottom end. You get metal down there and it chews up the, the cages pretty good. Pretty soon you're going to have a bearing failure. So if the top end's gone and there's metal 
you know, an abrasive slurry in the bottom end on these newer saws, whether it's a steel brand or a husky with the nylon cage bearings. Yeah, you can get lucky and there's going to be guys that say, oh, you just fix the top end, clean the bearings out. But I'm going to tell you that since they are plastic, if it ran for any period of time with that slurry, chances are you're, you're setting yourself up for a bottom end bearing failure on those things. And um, So I would pull it off and just look to make sure there hasn't been too much material that uh, broke off and went through the bottom end, you know? That's what I would do. So we're going to make that phone call. And then depending on what I hear, we either have a saw project or I'm going to go back to what I had planned on doing and going out in the woods and running my holes for them. So that's this. Easy fix. Well, I don't know. Another discussion. Now, I think it was the last video. Um, this piston would go right in there, by the way. When I had that holes form, a couple things I just wanted to show. You see how it shined right there? That was a result of that uh, piston slap. But that's the bad news. I want to look at this piston a little closer and give you some of the good news. See, both sides of that piston have, have showing where, look at all the blow-by, you know. This is actually a nice looking piece. Now I had put a little red barn piston in that saw. We're going to run that. And I got to tell you something. The piston that came out of it, it was made by the, the Holes Forma people, or at least their supplier. That's a better quality piston. If it was dimensionally correct, it would be a much better piston. And part of what I'm looking at is the uniform skirt thickness. And just the basic uh, look and feel of the casting, the cast piston. It's not a bad looking piston. I think what I would do, if they send me one, I think they're going to send me a piston for that saw. So I'm going to get rid of these goofy rings. I don't think they seated well. But I'm going to do things like uh, take a die grinder and just clean up the flashing in these windows right here. Just clean them up a little bit. Clean up that flashing. Clean up that. And then slap that piston in there. Maybe without a gasket to get a compression hit. We'll check the... Uh, we'll certainly check the squish first. But, and this material... I mean, I ran it for, I don't know, probably 10 tanks or so. And you can tell that this material is good. The piston material itself is a good material. Because it rattled like that, but look at that. Didn't fracture. Got some weight to it. It's not like those cheesy pistons we've seen in the past. Not that I'm talking up a bad piston, but I am talking up the materials that was using this bad piston. Ring stink. They didn't see it for nothing. Hey, look at how uniform that is. Nice quality looking stuff. Only problem is it's <laughs> five to seven thousandths too small in diameter to, at the, um, the skirt. Now, here's another thing. Now, I'm curious now. When you think about pistons, uh, here, here's just a little discussion. Usually, you're going to see a little different diameter on the crown, and this one here is 2.291. I'm going to do it in inches. See it? And this should be larger. It really is only two thousandths larger. And I just wonder if it was just machined wrong. Usually you're going to have a little bit of a flare, a little bit of a taper. You know, that, that number right there wouldn't scare me. This number does. Now the reason is because you have all the mass up here in the crown. When that thing gets hot and plus that's where the combustion is, it's literally going to expand more than the skirt, which is both cooler and there's less mass literally to expand. So there's a differential expansion in the pistons where the crown is going to go larger after it warms up than the skirt. 
not just because of the material, but also where the source of the heat is. And that's why oftentimes you'll see a taper from the top of the piston to the skirts. And let's see if I have another piston around. Here, here's a VEC. I got a couple of these. I got a pop-up for a 372. By the way, the one that I put in the 394 was not the best. I put that piston in. I think I showed on the video. I showed in the video the piston skirt was not uniform. Well, this one here is more so, but still it's not the best. So the actual quality of the holes form apart is better than the one I put in there. So let's see what this one has for, this should be 50 millimeter, or in this case, I'm going to say, uh, almost full 10 thousandths. Let me push on that. It's uh, 1.955. Push on this a little bit. One point nine six four. So it's a nine thousandths difference in diameter, and yet again, that's because of all the mass that's in the crown to push things apart as it gets hot relative to the skirt, but also because that's where the heat source is. And that taper is what the holes form of piston did not have. Go back and look at that again. Now that you've seen it, you can't unsee it. 2.293. 2 2.295. So you're only looking at a two thousandths difference in the taper. That piston didn't have a prayer. I'm sure that that uh, crown expanded as proper. You know, it did the way it was supposed to. But that one didn't. And that's why there was, first of all, a measurable difference in the clearance between this one and the VEC, which had the proper taper. So that's why this one rattles so much. And that's why you're having that premature wear right there, because, you know, it probably has darn or 10 thousandths difference between that wall and the cylinder wall at temperature when it should be down around 4 or 5. And that's it. Need to drill down on that a little bit. Nice looking material, you know, nice form, nice and uniform and all that good stuff. Just it has wrong dimensions. So I was saying that you probably should have a ten thousandths difference. Let's back that up with a melee piston or mall piston. This is uh, the best company in the world, by the way, for building cylinders. You can call them, I call them malls or melees. I remember that when they built the Cylinders for motorcycles, the European dirt bikes, like the Boltacos and stuff. They've been at it for a long time. If my premise is correct, that that holes form a piston, which has a three thousandths difference in the taper from the um, the crown to the the skirt, that's malformed. That's a bad that's a bad deal. And like I said before, it's. Uh, between 92, 90, 95, 3 thousandths from the diameter of the crown to the skirt. So let's measure this 385. 2.11 on the button. Okay, see that uh, 10 right there? So 2.11. One one two point one two ten thousandths. Yeah, I'll get there. Nine thousandths. So there's a there's a nine thousandths. Nope, a ten thousandths. A ten thousandths difference in the diameter of this crown to skirt. And again, that's because of the differential expansion, because of the extra mass that's up here, because it's a disc that goes all the way through plus the point of heat is right here on the piston. So definitely not dimensionally correct. And here's supporting evidence both on that 372 piston from VEC and the, the Mele 390 385 piston or the Mele 385 piston right here.
Well, I took a couple of whacks with this to see whether or not it was going to shake itself loose at all. You notice that it's already going back to black. You know, it's like a black oxide almost. And uh, this thing works pretty good. And it looks like they're hooking up their locomotives. They got a 4060 and 3018.